Anyway, good morning everyone. Nice to see you. I'd like to uh, start by uh, uh, asking our guests uh, to introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you used to do in real life if you're retired, where you live. We have some guests. Uh, is a new man a guest? Yes. A new man? Are you a new man? Well, I, I am a new man. I have been a new man. And uh, my name is Ralph Dratman, and I'm interested in math and physics. So I'm hoping there might be some other people here who are interested in that. I like to work on my computer on Mathematica, and I live here in Cherry Hill. And my, my mother is 99 years old, and she's over at Lionsgate. My wife lives with me in Cherry Hill, in Downs Farm. How am I doing? Good. Do you do web design? I know a lot about web design. We, we have our web designer. Anyone else? Uh, any other guests today? I know we have some fantasy football guests. I'll introduce my guest, my son, Alan Stein. Any, any other uh, fantasy football guests? Hey, Joe, my name's Adam. Uh, I uh, drove up from Middletown, Delaware today to assist my father and his friend Dan in their uh, fantasy football team. And I was here last year. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I want to try something a little different today. I, for some reason, we have a hard time understanding giving the people who need a little bit more time getting over to the buffet. So we're going to do it by boarding groups today. <laughs> So, after the mozi, we're going to have a mozi, and then we're have, going to have a boarding group one. And they are the people that need a little extra time getting I over. Have a baby. <laughs> okay. That's. <laughs> so, if if we could, um, Mar Marty uh, Marty Raffner is he here? Or Mar Marty, could you lead us in the mozi today as our past president? And then boarding group one will proceed to the tables and then give them, count uh, one elephant, two elephant, three elephant, up to 60, and then everybody else for breakfast, please. Thank you. 59, <laughs> All right, boarding, boarding group one, please proceed to the air. Anyway, I wanted to introduce our uh, two new board members, one of who's not here, Jay Sternchos, who is usually our... Uh, food preparation person, and Ron Ettinger. Ron, I know you're here somewhere. There's Ron. Ron, thanks for uh, being willing to serve. Um, I want to remind everybody, you'll see the emails. The September breakfast is not the 29th, which is our normal breakfast day. It's the 22nd. So it's the, it's the uh, I guess it's the fourth, the, is it the fourth one? Yeah, I guess it's the fourth uh, and not the fifth. So September 22nd, you'll see it on the emails, but don't show up on the 29th, there won't be any food. And, and the other thing I want to remind you is, it's going to be $8 starting in September, so uh, I know. I, 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 I pushed for that early in my presidency because I knew if I did it later I would not get reelected. So. Are you going to blame this? Um, the, the other thing. The other thing. Uh, I don't know if anybody noticed on the way in this morning the TV boards downstairs. If you wait around long enough, um, have our club on them. Uh, our meeting dates and so forth, uh, Rob Sachs was able to get that on and we're on there permanently on those TV boards letting everybody know that we're around. Um, the other thing that we've accomplished is we're also now listed in the Fed Flash. I don't know how many of you get that email every Friday, I think it is. Um, lists all the meetings in the area of all the synagogues and so forth. Um, we're also listed now in the Fed Flash every uh, Friday, showing our next meeting and also a link to our website. 
Um, we're going to have a fantasy football draft today after the meeting, so we want to move it right along. I know we're going to be here probably till 3 o'clock, but uh, <laughs> that's what happens. Um, Don, Don Weisenstein is uh, our commissioner. Don, anything to say this morning about the draft? Or? <laughs> yes, it's immediately after this meeting. Anybody that's not a, a member of it is welcome to stay and watch. Just give preferential seating to those that are involved with the draft. The draft boards are up there to my left. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> thanks, Don. Don't draft Andrew Locke. We have, yeah, don't draft Andrew Locke. He retired last evening. Uh, we have 14 teams this year. That's two more than last year? Yeah, uh, two more than last year. I mean, when we first started out, we had eight people. Six years ago, we have 30 now. 14 teams. 14 um, I wanted to let you all know, if you want to put it on your calendars now, we've also been very involved in the uh, holiday food sort for the food bank where all the synagogues collect food and bring them in and uh, we sort them and then they go to the food bank and we help the food bank put them on the uh, shelves there. Um, the dates are, and they're, um, they're here this year in the social hall. They used to always be at the annex. Um, they've changed the venue. It's here in the social hall. October 10th, which is I believe a Thursday, uh, we're making boxes and getting ready for the sort. And October 13th, which is a Sunday, um, we're actually doing the sorting, you know, by type of food and so forth. And then that following week after the 13th of October, um, they'll be needing us at the food bank to put a lot of this stuff on the shelves. So if you want to put it on your calendar, October 10th, October 13th, and then we'll, we'll mention it again at the next meeting. Um, Abe Furtis, do you want to... Give us a quick one about uh, American Treasure Tour or Bernie. I don't know who. Yeah. Uh, Abe? Yeah, we're a tag team. Yeah. Tag team? Hi. Uh, I'm going to stay away from here. Right? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> just a reminder that uh, September 19, we are going to the Museum of American Stuff. <laughs> Hard to describe. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a, the first time I think we've done it. We are combining it with a couples club. So Bernie is going to manage the whole the whole thing. So just send checks to Bernie. Uh, the, uh, I send out an email, and the address is there. And uh, again, lunch is going to be before, uh, uh, and it's you know on your own. There's a there's a nice restaurant there we can eat, and then we can go uh, to take the tour. Uh, Bernie, wh when do you want the money for by? Right now. <laughs> right now. Right now, I gotta get my check. We got, we got close to 40 people so far. Okay. And uh, it's you not know, a comedy guy. I don't want to overwhelm it. Okay, so yeah, please do it by by next Monday, okay? Send, send all the money next Monday. Just don't get shut out. This is one of our popular outings. Right, Bernie? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's the other thing. Uh, it's, it's a long ride, so, you know, most probably we should be organizing uh, carpools, too, uh, uh, because it's a long ride, so we, we, are, we, are, we understand that. Okay. It's an Oaks PA. Right. I wanted to t take a second. Um, as you know, um, uh, one of our members, uh, Larry Adelson, passed away about a month ago, and uh, I know a number of us were at a shiva and so forth. Um, we also planted a tree in his honor in Israel and got a nice note back from his wife, Esther Rose, and I just wanted to read it to you. Um, thank you for planting a tree in Israel in Larry's memory on behalf of the Jewish Men's Club. Um, the group was an important part of his life. Please thank the members for attending the funeral and the shiva. Uh, Bob Greenberg, wine tasting. You guys have these short questionnaires sitting at your table. This is to assist the philanthropic committee uh, to give us some direction as to where we want to uh, donate funds. Uh, a little background. We uh, were very fortunate over the past few years. Um, we had several requests that were given to us for the purpose of charitable donations and uh, the money that you guys 
uh, give for the mitzvah cards, that gets collected for donations, and we find ourselves with a good problem. Uh, we have uh, several thousand dollars. So the board decided that they needed a policy to memorialize how we're going to distribute uh, charitable funds. And this is part of that uh, uh, part of that policy. The first thing that we have to decide is just how much money we want to put aside each year for funds. The second is where do we want the money to go? And of course the third part is when do we want to give it? And so at this point um, the uh, committee uh, is in the process of making recommendations as to how much money we want to put aside per year. We're looking at, uh, our recommendation will be a five-year window uh, so that the monies we put aside for charitable donations will be spread over a five-year period. What we are looking for is direction from you guys as to what funds, specifically not which funds in particular, but in what categories do you want us to start looking for charities, local, national, Israeli? Um, so if you guys would please complete these, and we'll collect them. And based on how you guys rank them, that's the way the committee is going to start uh, uh, vetting charities. If you have any charities you want to suggest, feel free to jot them down. We'll take any and all suggestions. But uh, understand that when we vet them, we're going to be looking at, first of all, what the charity actually does versus what it says it does, how much of the money they actually use, and how effective they are. Because there are some charities that do very little, no matter what they say, and they eat up all the money in administrative funds. Okay. Any questions? Okay. The other thing I want to do is, I sent out an email um, earlier this month about wine tasting. We have two possible dates. We have September 8th and September 15th, and I'm going to pass around sign up sheet. I need you guys to put your, if you, if you want to go on the wine tasting, I need you to sign up, I need you to put your name, your email address, and how many people in your party, because it is limited, as I said in my email, it's a limited number of people that they can take. So, and if you would check off your preference as either September 8th or the 15th, or if it doesn't matter, check off either. And again, the majority will, 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 will uh, rule on that. And when I get the results, I will email you and let you know. It will be $15 a head. It will be at Amalthea Wineries, which is in Atco, which is about six miles down um, 30. Route 30 from Berlin. So it's not that far. It will start at 11 o'clock in the morning. That way, you, you, the, the wine tasting will last approximately an hour. That way, you get in, you do your wine tasting, and then you still have the rest of the afternoon. You can bring food if you want. They, they do not supply food per se, but you're more than welcome to bring picnic lunch or whatever you wish to do. Um, and we'll collect the money there. I would say collect the money now, <coughs> but all things considered, uh, it's probably easier if we just collect it there. So I'm going to pass this around. Anybody have any questions about the morning tasting? I have a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, the owner of the vineyard is a, an award-winning uh, winemaker. He has won for a New Jersey grape, for a New Jersey wine. He's won national awards, international awards. He just won a platinum. For his uh, for his Merlot, and that an international an international co uh, contest. He's also uh, uh, the best of Philly 2019. He's got the best rosé. 
So, I mean, it's not a shabby winery at all, okay? I wanted to mention uh, Bernie Schuster is running some car shows between, let me shut this down. Bernie, do you want to mention your car shows? So, good morning. Uh, I'm involved in seven car shows between now and the end of the summer. And the biggest ones are the Labor Day show at the Silver Diner. There's usually 300 to 350 cars there. And that's uh, Labor Day. And it starts at 9 in the morning and goes to about noontime. And we got 75 trophies. The shows are free for people to just look at it and touch the cars and so forth. But if you want to bring a car, it's $20. Then the next one, which is really magnificent, is Haddonfield. We take over the whole city of Haddonfield, and there is usually about 350 to 400 cars. And uh, I'm involved in that very for the last 30 years. The cars are magnificent. So uh, just read the stuff here. And then there's other shows which are not as big, but they're also prominent shows. So I have literature here. If you raise your hand, I'll give you some literature. And uh, hopefully I'll see you there. If you have any questions, uh, I'll answer any questions. I'm sitting over there. No, I don't have enough literature. I got 10 pieces of literature, so uh, I'm not sure I have enough to go around. But raise your hand and I'll give it to you. And if I don't have enough, I'll make some more for you. And any, any other questions? Yes. You need literature. Yes. Yeah, you would like to get that sheet? I'll be right over there. <laughs> Raise your hands and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie. Ed, Ed Silver um, is going to talk about a joint breakfast or no. lunch or dinner joint, or joint eagles. Joint eagles. Something joint with the eagles. Hi, guys. Uh, if you remember, last month I asked if there was any interest. For the last several years, we've done a joint venture with another men's club from uh, another from other synagogues. And it was very popular, very well received. Uh, the best one was the uh, last one because it was a morning and the Eagles were in England and every, we had a great turnout. We've also met at night and we've had, uh, actually our men's club outnumbered the temple that we, uh, the men's club from the temple that we participated in. Um, so you showed an interest in, to do it again. So I have some good news and bad news. <laughs> the bad news is uh, the scheduling for the Eagles games at night or on afternoons, the uh, temples didn't seem to be interested because uh, they were either home games or it was too late at night. I did find a synagogue that was interested in doing an activity with us. So the bad news is it's going to cost you some money. So let me tell you what it is. I don't have all the details yet. They haven't gotten back to me. Um, at the manual, their men's club is actually doing a one o'clock uh, October 6th Eagles Jets game and they're having a lunch at Dooney's Tavern on Route 73 North in Voorhees and we're invited but it's $20 we don't get, I don't have all the details yet um, but if you're interested I'll send an email out and next month I'll also have a sign-in sheet and I'm not sure yet if you have to pay at the door or if I have to, you have to pay ahead of time, I'll give you the details. So I'm hopeful we'll have a turnout. I know it's a little bit of a departure spending that kind of money. I'm told the lunch is really gonna be good. It's a buffet lunch, so you can take as much as you want. Bill Roth, you can take as much as you want. <laughs> so I'll get back to you next month and see if there's any interest. Uh, let me just make one other comment. If you, if you notice, we're not just a breakfast meeting. Look at the different programs that came up as a result of interest from the men in the men's club. And we had guys coming here at 8 o'clock in the morning slicing onions and locks and things like that. For those of you who are not active yet, we're, I encourage you, if you have a program idea, hit any of the board members and see if uh, you can organize something that would be of interest to the men. It's the same people. It's the Bob Greenbergs. Uh, it's uh, just lost the name, but a lot of guys do this programming. I invite you to get involved. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, I, I agree with Ed. I mean, I, I'm not one of the old timers here, although I'm getting up in age also. Um, I know some of these guys have been around with this men's club when it was still part of a synagogue back in maybe 30 years ago. Is that close? <laughs> So get involved. Uh, it's a lot of fun. 
Uh, most of you are retired. Uh, um, you know, come up with some ideas. Uh, ask about joining the board. Um, we, we always need help. Come here at 8 o'clock on a Sunday and help us cut up some vegetables and put food out and so forth. Um, I, I always like, uh, I don't know if it's Don's line originally or Ed Silver's line, it's not a breakfast club, guys. Um, let's see. Mike Perloff, did you want to say something about a science museum? You had mentioned that, I guess, previously. Uh, Abe Furtis. Abe Furtis? Abe Furtis wants to say something about a science museum? or it, Well, if you recall, a few months ago we had a speaker, a young lady from the science museum, what, what's it, some industry museum in Philadelphia. It, every, a lot of hands went up. I don't know if you were trying to be nice to the speaker when she asked about coming over or not. I saw a lot of hands go up. Um, if you recall, it was, you know, they've got all kinds of exhibits there and they have to do with industry, science, uh, engineering. I don't know if you remember, were, were there people that were interested? I'd like to see hands if, if there are. Looks like a lot of people. Mike, organize something for us. Sounds like there's interest. Um, Dave Schwartz, yes. you were gone before. I thank you for taking care of the food today. Uh, you did such a great job. I'm going <laughs> to recommend you to Richie to uh -oh. fill in for him anytime he's out. All right. Okay. And would you like to come up and introduce our speaker this morning? I thought you would get a laugh out of this as I did. I was asked to get a couple things for this morning's breakfast. I went to BJ's for the lox, whitefish, etc., etc., three dozen eggs, and some other things. Took them home, put them in the refrigerator. I think it was Wednesday. Thursday, in the middle of the night, I wake up and I think I got to call Ed Silver about this breakfast. So I called Ed and I said, I bought the fish, I bought the eggs. What exactly is supposed to happen with these eggs between now and nine o'clock Sunday morning? He says, what do you mean? I said, well, how do they become hard boiled eggs? <laughs> he said, didn't he tell you? I did if I didn't want to bring that up. <laughs> you can buy hard boiled eggs, I think shelled or not shelled. Yes. So I spaced it over two, three days, a couple eggs at a time. <laughs> Those damn shells didn't want to come off for nothing. It was amazing. Anyway, it, it was a pleasure. Uh, I'd like to th thank Steve Frischberg for coming. By the way, I apologize. I somehow put a C, an extra letter in his name. A C, I misspelled it in giving it uh, the information to the newspaper. In any event, Steve is going to give you a short bio about himself. He's the chairman of the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Please welcome Steve Frischberg. Thank you and good morning. I asked Dave to skip an introduction, but he asked that I provide some background. So here it goes. It'll only take about 40 minutes. <laughs> I was born and raised in Oxford Circle. I went to Temple University, undergrad to become a CPA. I went to Temple Law School for a law degree. I went to Temple Law School for a master's in trial advocacy. And then I went to NYU for a master's in tax law. I'm authorized to practice in Pennsylvania, not New Jersey, and Florida though. My main field of concentration is estate administration and estate planning. And I'm a partner in my own law firm. <clears throat> I've been married for 45 years. I have three children, three grandchildren, and one due within the next two weeks. I've been involved in many charitable organizations, many Jewish organizations, as well as the American Cancer Society, the Wellness Centers, past officer of the Philadelphia State Planning Council, past president of Golden Slipper, and obviously chairman of the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. I did put on each table our ad book from this last year's induction, so I ask you to circulate it to the people at your table. I thank you for inviting me to speak to you this morning about the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. 
As I have mentioned to David, though I have been chairman of his organization for the past 14 years, I am neither an athlete nor a sports person, but will be glad to give you a glimpse into our museum, how it came to be, and the challenges we face. And I did walk in, just when you were talking about giving money to charity, maybe you'll think of the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame as one of your recipients. But let me start with some ancient history, and then relate some information about the Hall of Fame and my personal involvement. Jews and sports is a quintential Jewish story. The reconciliation of being a Jew and being involved in sports has a 2,500 year history. Though a number of Jews have famously excelled in sports, the prevailing stereotype is that Jews are not particularly athletic. That stereotype has historical roots as ancient Jewish thinkers were leery of sports. In the beginning, Jews respected the strongest among us, Samson, Gideon, and David. Yet over time, the biblical image of the strong and powerful Jew gave way to the stereotype of people who are weak, who are unwilling to fight, and unable to truly compete in the athletic field. This belief that Jews don't do sports exists even today sometimes humorously reinforced by Jews themselves in movies, television, and culture. But where did it come from? How did the stereotype image develop? The answer is found in the early practice of our faith. Jews were ruled in the errors of the first and second temple by the ancient Greeks who idolized physical perfection. As such, sports were viewed as idol worship and were performed mostly in the nude. It is therefore not surprising that Jewish texts from post-biblical and Talmudic periods were critical of sporting activities. Those texts expressed a directive, nice Jewish boys, of course, no mention of girls, should be in the study hall, not the gym. It was taught that the Talmud condemns Roman sporting events as they were barbaric, especially the sadism of gladiatorial combat. Sports then was a form of worshiping the body, kind of brutal, not to mention murderous, not very Jewish. The perception was that getting involved in sports in ancient times <clears throat> was one of the things that took Jews away from being Jewish. Over the centuries that followed, our exile from the land of Israel made pursuing Jew sports nearly impossible. Those that wanted to pursue sports were shut out either by governmental barriers or rabbis discouraging their involvement or parents pushing their children to careers that were more respectable and more portable in time of crisis. A Jewish mother much preferred to say, my son the doctor, versus my son, the football player. But at the end of the 19th century, the wings of change were in the air. In the late 1800s, part of the Zionist movement asked for a muscle Jewry, a cadre of young men and young women who were strong and able to dispel the image of the weak Jew by competing against the world on the athletic field and possibly even in the military. So the 20th century dawned, a new era began. Beginning in the 1920s, the idea that begins to permeate among pious Jews is to use sports as a wedge that can be used to identify with Judaism. Kids who come to play may stay to pray. In the late 1920s, Jews became the Dominic ethnicity in America prize fighting. This was true as going to college and becoming a professional were not necessarily real options for the majority of Jewish youngsters. Getting an opportunity to make it in America in 1930 by fighting was very attractive. Prior to the establishment of the National Basketball Association, professional basketball was also largely dominated by Jewish players. 
In baseball, though, we didn't have many players, but we did have Hank Greenberg and Sandy Koufax, both of whom have been transformed into mystic heroes. Maccabi games came into existence because other clubs would not let Jews participate. The Philadelphia Jewish Sports of Fame actually honors each year at our induction ceremony those graduating Maccabi athletes who have excelled in their respective sport. There was a time when Jews were unable to walk into a public park and engage in healthy sports. In the United States, the New York Athletic Club would not allow Jews in their facility. Hitler forbade Jews to participate in the Olympics because he wanted to show Aryan supremacy and wanted to avoid the embarrassment if a Jew ended up standing on the podium as that would have been a counter narrative to what he wanted to project. Hank Greenberg left at the height of his baseball career to fight the Nazis. Jews also became pioneers of the art of self-defense and found new ways to become owners and managers. Today, over one-third of professional football teams, 20% of hockey teams, and 40% of basketball teams are owned by Jews. Seeing Jeff Lurie and Bob Kraft fighting it out on the football field was a positively strong message to our youth. Today, the benefits of sports I suggest to you are fully recognized by both observant and non-observant Jews, in that most realize that so much can be learned by our children through sports. Teamwork, selflessness, winning, and respect. Sports is one of the ways for people to come together. With victory and each success, Jewish athletes created an image that make all Jews proud, proving we can do we can and do succeed in all aspects of modern life. Which brings me to the formation of the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. For those of you who are not familiar with the Philadelphia Jewish Hall of Fame, it is a jewel of a museum that was established within the city of brotherly love 22 years, that's Philadelphia, with a, sorry. <laughs> Uh, 22 years ago by Harvey Brodsky and Bill Stearman to honor the best of the best, those individuals who through perseverance, dedication, superior talent, and skills have risen to the top of their respective sports. Their names and achievements are celebrated within the halls of the Adolph and Rose Levine Museum, honoring the past and present, creating inspiration for future Jewish athletes. We have tried to fulfill this mission year after year. We have visitors from within our community and across the country who discover the vast and broad accomplishments of Jewish men and women who have made substantial contributions to the wide world of sports. The museum honors those who have come before us, those who are among us today, and we hope to continue to honor those who will come after us. The Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame contains a remarkable collection of athletes and others involved in sports. We have inducted 18 Olympians, including six medal winners, two world boxing champions, three women who've made first team All-American in lacrosse, people who wrote or sang brilliantly about sports, and others who founded, owned, or managed professional franchises or announced games. To be nominated, a nominee must have at least one Jewish biological parent or have con or had converted to Judaism, he himself or herself, and the nominee must have lived in or been involved with a sports team or sports activity in the greater Philadelphia area. And as you can see, we expanded from Philadelphia per se to southern New Jersey and Delaware, we expanded the area, but we kept the name still Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. We hold an induction ceremony once every year in April. This coming year, as it was last year, as you see in the book that's being circulated, it's at Road of Shalom again on April 30th, and obviously you were all invited to attend. We are fortunate at, to have and continue to have 
Michael Barkan as our MC. Michael, as you most of you probably know, is a sports announcer, both on the radio and TV, and also an inductee in the Hall of Fame 2010. In addition, Mark Zumoff, inducted in 2011, and Glenn Macnow, inducted in 2016, both sports announcers have substituted for Michael when he has a scheduling conflict. This past year, we inducted a diverse group. Chris O'Loughlin, yes, he is Jewish, a four-time All-American in fencing. Coincidentally, he was coached by a past inductee, David McConnick, from 1997, for his fencing accomplishments, who was able to attend this year's induction, which was a very nice moment. Howie Roseman, Executive Vice President of Philadelphia Eagles. Myra Sack, an outstanding soccer player. She was second all-team All-American at Dartmouth and won the Dartmouth's Dean Plate Award. Mike Kobloff, a relief pitcher for two Major League Baseball teams, Arizona Diamondbacks, and then the Cleveland Indians. He grew up in Philadelphia and presently is a pitching scout for the Phillies. Colby Cohen played hockey for Colorado Aval Avalanche and the Boston Bruins, also raised in Philadelphia, actually Villanova area. And Chuck Brodsky, a songwriter and troubadour who has 22 songs enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame. This past year, we created a special award, the Simcha Gersh Award, honoring a non-professional team. The recipient was the Pine Forest Camp Jewish Basketball League, which won 11 championships over its 16-year run from 1990 to 2006. In addition, we recognize, but not necessarily annually, individuals who were not star athletes that are not highly visible of the media or other activities related to sports, but for other reasons ranging from the founding of the Hall of Fame to building local community centers have made an unusually important impact on Philadelphia area sports. They received the Pillar of Achievement Award. Some of the past pillars are Ike Kozloff and Ike Richmond in 2002, owners of the 76ers, Ed Rendell in 2014, a great sports enthusiasm, enthusiast and fan, and your own Lou Katz in 2012, who provided leadership and funding for a broad range of philanthropic athletic activities. This year, I personally was honored and humbled to be the recipient of the Philadelphia Pillar Award and join the rank of these illustrious pillars. To give you the idea of the quality and diversity of our inductees, indulge me as I highlight some of our past inductees, all of whom you can discover on our webpage, phillyjewishsports.org, or in the ad book that circulated. Eddie Gottlieb, 1997 basketball. Harry Litwack, 1999 Temple basketball coach. Ed Snyder, Sports Administration, 1999. Dave Zinkoff, 1998 sports announcer. Ed and Steve Sobel, who founded NFL Films in 1998. Dolph Shays in 1997 for basketball. Bonnie George, 2000 golf. Benny Bass, 2000 boxing. Al Meltzer, sports commentator in 2001. Red Klotz, 2001 basketball. Stan Hockman, O2 Sports Media, Bonnie Rosen, 2000 Lacrosse, Russell Peltz, a boxing promoter in 2002, Al Schreier, 2003 Sports Administration, Red Cardonic, 2005 Football, Hotsey Reinfield, 05 in Basketball, Merrill Reese, 06 in Media, Julian Krinsky, 07 in Tennis, Chad Levitt, 08 professional football player. Roger Schwab, sports medicine in 08. Ruben Amaro, 2009 Phillies baseball manager. And also, yes, he is Jewish, his mother is Jewish. Phil Jasner, 2009 sports writer, passed away after he received the award. Andrea Kremer, 2010 sports correspondent. 
Brian Roberts from Comcast in 2010 squash, Leon Rose here from Jersey, a 2011 sports agent, Buzz Bissinger, a sports writer, 2012, Larry Brown, 2013 basketball coach, Howard Eskin, 14 sports media, Leonard Toes, 2014 football, Arne Tellum, 2015 a sports agent. And in 2015, we nominated a gentleman named Norman Constantine. Norman was a heroic but tragic figure as the Nittany Lion, Penn State Nittany Lion mascot. He brought status to the role and served unselfishly to those with physical challenges. He died from a hit and run accident after, eight years after graduation. There was much discussion about whether or not he deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. Was being a mascot of athletic superiority. After much discussion, it was determined that he should be inducted. His induction turned out to be one of our most popular inductions, bringing out people who fondly remembered him and his accomplishments, and who had never heard of him, had never heard about the Hall of Fame. There was also Mo Tenner, 2016, inducted for basketball. It's an interesting side story. Mo was qualified to be inducted due to his basketball accomplishments. I actually knew him when I was a kid and went to Camp Log and Twig, at which time he was the head male counselor. At a nominating committee, his name was nominated and it was unanimously determined that he should be inducted. But someone at that meeting said he had passed away. We were very disappointed that we had not considered him during his lifetime. Um, a couple of weeks later, I, was, I personally was out with another couple, friends of ours, the wife of whom attended Camp Log and Twig, and she remembered Mo Tanner, and what she remembered about Mo Tanner is his piercing blue eyes, which I personally did not recall. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of weeks. I deliver challahs every Friday afternoon to Jewish patients at uh, HUP, at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. One room that I went into had the name Tenor on the bed sign, but obviously it wasn't Mo, as I had been told he had passed away. I handed him the challah, and I noticed amazing blue eyes, amazing. When it, and I said to myself, could it be? But no, it couldn't be because I was told he had passed away. I could not have a conversation with him because he was really out of it. So I left the room, walked to the elevator, and then I just said to myself, I have to check this out. And I went back and I spoke to the nurse and sure enough, it was Mo Tenner. I went into the room and on a sign, it said for emergency call Mrs. Tenner at this particular phone number. Right then and there, I called her, told her he was going to be a recipient of the award. They were very touched and fortunately he lived to attend the induction ceremony and died shortly there, thereafter. So that was just a, a, a coincidental thing of fate. Another inductee you may know is Joe Banner from Sports Administration and also Lou Scheinfeld in 2018, a sports administrator who gets a lo lot of attention today because he's trying to create the Philadelphia Museum of Sports down near the sports complex in Philadelphia. My personal involvement when I began when I sat on the board of the JCCs of Philadelphia. After one board meeting, I was asked if I would sit in on a meeting of the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame as they could use some younger members. I was only 60 at the time. I did attend a meeting and the discussion was really beyond my expertise, but I felt an obligation to attend the, the induction ceremony that year and was joined very reluctantly by my wife. 
It turned out to be an amazing and emotional evening just to hear from the inductees as to how sports affected their lives and in many cases the discrimination they endured and how they dealt with it. For example, Eve Ellis could not play tennis at the Murray and Cricket Club because she didn't have the right white tennis outfit. The more I got involved, the more I recognized the importance of having a museum like the Hall of Fame to create pride within the Jewish community for the accomplishments of Jews in sports and to be a source of inspiration to our Jewish youth. We were initially housed at the JCC at Broad and Pine in Philadelphia until this past year. The Gershwin Y had sold its building to the University of Arts about 25 years ago, retaining a 15-year lease with no annual rent. We were then a part of that JCC. About 10 years ago, the University of Arts started to charge rent, and the JCC kicked us out, so to speak. Uh, because they really couldn't afford to keep us. We were forced to pay rent and we were forced to get our own executive director. Our fundraising each year hopefully generates a, a net profit of about $50,000, which just pays for our annual expenses. The economic problem that we have is we do not have a strong core of followers. We have our board members, and we have the people who are being honored. Depending who's being honored determines the number of attendees that we have at our induction. Though every inductee, past inductee, has stated in their remarks how honored they are and touched they are to have been inducted, I cannot say with any honesty, on average, that our past inductees generally support us by either attending or with financial commitments. Though this past year I inaugurated a thousand dollar club and in that fundraising effort, some of our past inductees did raise the bar and did contribute to help us substantiate our mood. As the University of Arts took possession as of January 1st, we relocated to the Federation building at 21st and Arch and transformed the museum into the 21st century with digital and interactive monitors. Our memorabilia is displayed on a rotation basis to provide more visibility of our collection. Previously, we occupied two physical rooms at the Gershwin Y filled with free standing placards for each year, each of which had the plaques for those inductees for that particular year. It was very cumbersome. I changed the format, format by eliminating the placards and have these interactive monitors. Due to the change in format, we are no longer in need of dedicated rooms, but all we need now is a visible wall that I put a piece of vinyl on that's very enticing, and a monitor and an interactive website to our, our interactive TV to our website. Because of that, I am now shopping the museum to other locations, including this particular JCC. I'm in discussions with them to see if they have a wall that would be available. I am also looking at some synagogues in Philadelphia, the Kaiserman and Klein JCCs, as well as Gratz College and the Barrack School in Grimoire. The biggest conflict we have each year in our nomination process is who do we select? We seek those who have succeeded in the world of sports because they were able to overcome adversity and skepticism and had the desire and determination to succeed. Our inductees have achieved some remarkable accomplish accomplishments which made them worthy of induction. We work as a committee of the whole of our board to make our selections. We invite nominations internally and from the public at large through social media, our website, and the Jewish Exponent. We painfully try to select those that are worthy of induction, and this is the key point. Without estimating the financial support he or she may generate. We're different than, let's say, Israeli bonds, where the honoree is, no disrespect, which the honoree is usually chosen for their ability to generate bond sales as well as for them to make a contribution through the purchase of a bond. 
The only requirement we have is that you now have to attend the induction ceremony. <laughs> other than if you passed away, because we do honor people that have passed away. Some inductees give us a list of people to invite or solicit to buy ads, and some, as Howie Roseman, who we anticipated would be a big draw because of his name and because of his mailing list, and here's where the conflict is, we would not pick Howie Roseman because of that, but it was a nice benefit that we anticipated that to happen. Unfortunately, Howie Roseman said to us, I don't want to give you a mailing list. I don't want to invite anybody. I want this to be very, very special, and I only want my parents, my wife, and my children to attend. And we honored that request. I did a little end run around him and went to the Eagles myself, and they did buy an ad, which I think you'll see in the yearbook. As I initially stated, it's ironic that I have led this museum for the past 14 years when not being athletic. But through my years with the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, I've come to understand the glory of playing sports and also to appreciate sports from all vantage points. As I've listened to speeches of coaches, members of the media, administrators, and those who have heard the adulation of Philadelphia fans as they celebrate their heroes. It allowed me to develop an appreciation for the hard work and perseverance athletes put themselves through. There's an old joke from the goofball movie Airplane where a stewardess responding to a passenger's request for light reading material hands her a microscopic pamphlet entitled Famous Jewish Sports Legends. <laughs> well, our museum has shown that that book is out of date. That stewardess was wrong. There are plenty of famous Jewish sports legends around and more coming every day. The next one could be living on your block or going to your children's school or sitting next to you in shul. Jews are at the mainstream of sports, not only on the field itself, but in the commissioner's office, the owner's box, the front office, or even managing a major league team like Gabe Kapler of the Phillies. And we're only going to become more of a force in the years to come. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to uh, answer some questions. And I, what I tried to do is really to give you an insight of how our committee works and, and the issues that we do have in picking people. Yes, sir. As a side note about Harry Lickwack, the Temple coach. Yes. He was also my gym teacher at Fells. Mine too. I, I went to Fells. Uh, I'm not sure, sir, where'd you grow up? I'm 73. I grew up in Lebanon in Castor. Castor and McGee. Oh, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> um, but which side of Castor? <laughs> the Jewish side. <laughs> 1300. Okay. Uh, there was no smoking, of course, in the school. Right. But Harry Lidwack was a cigar smoker. If you walked into his office, you couldn't breathe from the cigars, but no one ever said a word. <laughs> also, I noticed going through the book, one of the great pictures in Philadelphia history, Saul Rogovin, I don't see his name anywhere. So, so here, here's the problem. That question is perfect. Because he mentions a name, I don't even know who he's talking about, okay? That's the problem with me. However, the group of people that are on my board, if, if, you, if they were here and you mentioned his name, they would tell you what high school he went to, what he played, why he's not inducted, or why he should be inducted. All I would ask you is go on site and send in his name, because we don't know everybody, or we can't think of everybody, and we're looking. That's why we're, this year we're putting out much more in social media to invite people to submit nominations. So please put his name in. The sports announcer at the time was Kelly, I forget his first name. He was Gene also Kelly. Gene, Gene Kelly. Gene Kelly was also Oh, Gene Kelly. Kelly, right. I remember that name, actually. Yes, sir. Um, can you mention that uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that you're trying to get uh, the JCC here to be a uh, home for uh, your get a museum? Wall. Yes. What's the status of it, and is there something we can do to help? Yes. Uh, so let me get the date. Brian Adler. Yeah. yeah. That's who. When I called, whoever the the main person is was away. So I've been in touch with Brian Adler. 
his boss. Yeah. yeah, and he was away. So I spoke to Brian Adler. So if you could talk to him, I just emailed him last week, and I haven't heard back from him. Maybe so. if you can send the thing to the club. And I, I, okay. Something on that. And then we have a guy that on, on our board that used to be on the board of the JCC, and maybe he can help do something. Okay. It's, so if you send something to us. Wherever. I'll send it to Dave and then he'll yeah, okay. circulate. Right it, all we're looking for is a wall and it could be any size because I can make the vinyl as big or as small as we need and then it has a monitor and it depends if they have more room it can have an interactive one and it's good for you get so many young people that come here it would be good for them to see that such a thing even exists. So someone, yes sir. Oh. Dad lived in an orphanage with his brother back in the 19, 1910s, and uh, he had for his gym coach in junior high school Eddie Gottlieb. Yeah, who is one of our inductees? Yes. I played soccer at Temple, and my coach was Pete Linus, who was a Jew, and he had a very successful record. However, I didn't think it was a good coach, so uh, you decide why. what you need to do about that. <laughs> Put them in. We'll be glad to vet them out. We'll be glad to. Steve, thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate thank you it. very much. Thank you. So normally I would be handing Steve this beautiful certificate that Richie Moskowitz wow. so nicely prepared for me. And of course, I left it at home. So I, I, want, I, want, I want to get your address and we'll okay. mail it to you. Dave has my card. Okay, uh, okay. fine. Thank and you. Uh, it's for a year's membership here at the men's club. Come back and join us anytime. That's very sweet. I may do that. In fact. Okay. Thank you. And if you would, uh, would you like to select for us our 50 50 winner? Sure. Stan? Uh, Shumas, you want to bring up the uh, the cards and the money? You have the bag with the. I handed it. He's just handing his. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank I'll get it. I'll get it. That's right. Five, six, eight. Last three numbers. Five, six, eight. That's not the right number. The last three numbers. Five, six, eight. I'm sorry, Mark. Oh, there he is. All right. Drum roll.